This tape is part of the Middle Tennessee Oral History Collection designated as MT 2000.057. This is Betty Rowan. Today is Wednesday, September 5th, 2001, and I'm interviewing Rose Witherspoon Spence at her hometown of Columbia, Tennessee. The tape of this interview, along with the transcription of the interview, will become part of the MTSU Oral History Collection and will be available to the public. Future researchers may include portions of this interview in their publications. Is that all right with you, Rose? That is all right with me. Okay. I want to be sure we're getting you good. So this is our mic, and I'm going to keep that over on your side of the table. Uh, we'll start with some things for the record. Your name? Rose Witherspoon Spence. Okay. And your date of birth? 2 2 24. Okay. And your birthplace? Columbia. You were born in Columbia? I was born in Murray County, but not in Columbia. Murray County. Mm -hmm. But I was a baby when my mother, my mother and father moved to Nashville. Okay. Your father's name? My father was Reverend Andrew Witherspoon. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you tell me he was a, a minister? He was a minister, that is right. Grew up a Protestant a, minister. Mm -hmm. Grew up a minister's daughter. Yes. Tell me memories of that. Pardon? Tell me memories of that. Tell you what? Memories of growing up in a minister's home. Oh, memories of that. I was one of 12 children, uh, five girls and seven boys, and it was a world of men. We were trained and taught that our whole life was to make sure that these men were happy. My mother never worked. She raised 12 children and entertained all the church ladies and the, all the ministers at our house. It became a place where ministers came to just sit and relax. Uh, we built a new house in 1935, right after the Depression, 10-room brick house early on, and with a big porch, and men just loved to come there and sit and talk with my father, all about the different churches that they ran and the bishops would come by and they'd send other people there. So we were just there for the purpose of entertaining and making certain that the men had everything that they needed. Which as a girl, as we got older, didn't set too good with us. <laughs> we didn't want to wait on all these men. We got tired of it. What were some of the responsibilities that you had as a small child? Looking after two little brothers that were younger than me was the only responsibility that I had. I was never allowed in the kitchen because I was in the way. My two older sisters learned how to cook because Mama was cooking all the time. And um, that was in the days when someone came to your house, you served them food. And consequently, my mother and my two older sisters were cooking and the young children get out. out. So all Rose could do was watch the two little baby brothers out in, under the tree in the backyard. Never learn to cook anything. <laughs> Went in the military not knowing how to boil water. <laughs> you probably didn't need to in the military. Never learned that. <laughs> <laughs> what was your mother's name? Mary Jones Witherspoon. My mother was a Flyson, and uh, she was born in Murray County in a place called Zion, which was set up by the Presbyterian Church. And these people who built Zion, which is a very famous historical place in Murray County, uh, came from South Carolina. And it was 20 families, and they established the Presbyterian religion in Murray County. They came, they were descendants, particularly one family was a descendant of one of the signers of the Constitution, which was John Witherspoon. And that's where my father got his name, Witherspoon. Mm -hmm. His father was owned by this family. And he was freed when he was 12 years old, my grandfather, by the Witherspoons, who are very famous here in my county, mm -hmm. at this place called Zion. 
wonderful heritage to have. And it may be where my father became a minister because my grandfather was given to a child, a boy who was the same age, and to be his companion. And so he followed this boy around wherever he went. This was a young white boy. And he followed him to school. And he sat in the corner in the back of the school. And then he brought him home and played with him. And my grandfather learned to read by sitting in the back of the school in this place called Zion. And when he grew up, he uh, read things to people. That was his profession, though they didn't call it that then. But because he had learned to read, he could read documents, and he read them for white people and black people, and anyone who needed to have something with. And in our family, reading was very important, being that we were people that were poor, who had just come one generation from slavery. We had one book. It was called The Bible, mm -hmm. and we all read it. And we became very knowledgeable about the book. And in our family, the things that we built our life on was built on the life of Jesus. And when my father reprimanded us, he would say, now what would Jesus do about that? And so we thought, well, if we could get rid of him, we'd do all right. <laughs> Because when the gospel is being told, you can't tell stories, and you can't do this, and you can't do those things. But we didn't know that the rest of the world wasn't like that, too. We thought the whole world was that way. <laughs> I'm going to stop this and check our recording level before we get too far. We were talking about your childhood. Tell me about your early education experiences, early school experiences. Um, I attended school in, in my neighborhood, and uh, which the same school where all of my brothers and sisters went to. It was called Ashcraft. It's no longer there in Nashville. And uh, I grew very tall and lanky and was very athletic. I was taught many things that boys do as a girl, and I never really realized that I was different until I was a teenager, and the boys that I had grown up with discovered I was a girl. I went to the beauty shop and got this long hair. Uh, fixed and it looked different than the two plaits that was always hanging down my back. And then they wouldn't play with me anymore because you're a girl. And then I decided what horrible place this is in life. All of my friends are no longer playing with me because now they've discovered I'm 12 or 13 that I'm a girl. And I uh, was very talkative and was on every play that was in school, on every program. And I kept getting so tall that at age 13, I was the tallest girl in the school. And I wanted to bend over because I was too tall. I wanted to be short like the other girls, but my father would not allow it. I had tall brothers and a tall father and a tall mother and sisters that were short. And this sister, Rose, grew taller and taller and taller. So I became an athlete because of the height. I played softball on the school teams, played basketball, went on to high school and played basketball, took dancing, had long legs, did active things, active in the plays, in the band. I didn't play an instrument. I took piano, but I didn't play an instrument, but I sang in the choirs. And I did that all my life. When I left school, I sang in the choir at college, played basketball at college. When I left there, I went to the military and played basketball there. <laughs> so I think being tall designates that you will play basketball. <laughs> I think so, but I think your childhood experiences, it sounds like, also make you one of those people who would look at the military later on. I think that's true because uh, unlike many uh, girls growing up, m particularly women who didn't grow up with brothers, I think that made a great deal of difference in how I looked at things mm -hmm. because I was familiar with the men's world because these brothers had friends 
Seven brothers had seven friends apiece, which kept 49 boys in our yard all the time. Mm -hmm. And my mother was very, very um, conscious of the fact that she had all these children and all these men, and she didn't allow us to go to other people's yards to play. We had to stay within our own confines, and therefore, if you played with us, you had to play in our yard where my mother could look out the door and see that everything was going according to her. So she kept us rather close, but also because of that, uh, other kids in the neighborhood played in our yard. It became like a park. And um, there were rules and regulations like any other park. Uh, you couldn't say bad words in the yard. We didn't hear bad words. My mother and father never used bad words. Um, and if you did it, other children would tell you, you can't say that here, this is Reverend Witherspoon's yard. You have to go. So there were other people policing the yard as though it was theirs, <laughs> and we never did have to police it. Mm -hmm. But it gave me an atmosphere of, um, of class, and that was terribly important to my mother, that her children were children of class, because if we were not, it was reflection on my father as a minister. So we couldn't yell loud, we couldn't be disrespectful, and uh, we were grown up before we knew that our brother wasn't somebody important because when he would come to visit, we had to wait on him and give him water and give him whatever he asked for. And finally, one day I said to my mother, I said, why when Sam comes to visit, this is my oldest brother who's grown up and gone from home and I'm a little girl, um, we have to wait on him so much. I said, she says, well, that's your brother, and you should treat him nice. Uh, he's older. But he's a brother. Do we have to treat older brothers like we treat older people? <laughs> yes, you have to do that. So we learn to respect age. And as I had lived in this world, I think the loss of that is very damaging to our children because in the world in which they will grow up there will be people of age thank goodness because it's the age that tells us about life mm -hmm. if we don't respect that we will not learn that's true very true rose tell me when you first remember becoming aware of the events leading up to war the involvement for the United States. I'm sure you probably read in the paper the things that were happening in Europe, but it seemed a long way away. Yes, it did. Um, I um, was a history major, and I was very interested in history and interested in the world. So I read a lot about what was going on and kept up with the papers. And during the time when I was a teenager and um, I remember about the United States involvement in Europe before the war broke out and what was going on over there. And I read it, every word I could get, um, our reaction to what was happening in Germany in particular. Mm -hmm. And uh, the leadership of this country was trying to come to grips with things in Europe and was very much in the papers and very much be in our country. And of course that was the thing to keep up with and as a history major I was very interested in that. So I knew that things were not looking good. It was building toward war. And um, I was never interested in war per se because we had not been around where there was violence and things like that. But just people. I was interested in knowing about the German people, mm -hmm. or the English people, uh, people of all nationalities because of my love of history. People were very important. And um, when the war broke out, 
and my brothers were conscripted to go. This was a fearful thing for us in America. Now, but were you still listen. in high school? I was in college. You were in college. I was in college. And that, was that in Nashville at TSU? At Tennessee, Tennessee State mm -hmm. University. Okay. And I was a history major there. And during the summer, I had gone with my brother, who had gone to work in the defense plant, uh, um, to spend the summer with them. And that was a new experience for me, uh, having spent my life in Nashville to suddenly go to a big city like Cleveland. There was lots of things to learn about living in a big city. Mm -hmm. And uh, riding on the streetcar, it was very important that you didn't get lost, because if you forgot where you lived, you oh. couldn't ask somebody, do you know where I live? You were mm -hmm. in a big city, so you had to be very cautious and careful and paid attention. And so I think that experience was good too, because it taught me to be independent, to take care of myself. And my brother who had to go off to work married my classmate, and she and I were friends, and we remain friends to this day. She's in New York City, and she comes to visit me occasionally here in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. But we learned to be women, go into town and places and be alert to where we were and alert to the people around us because for the first time we didn't have the comfort of the brothers or the friends to protect us as women. Mm -hmm. So before I learned that experience in the military, I had it by going to the big city of taking care of myself. And once I joined up, that was the first thing they taught us. You're in the army now. The song, you're not behind the plow. Those things were, you've got to get your mind on what you're doing here. Mm -hmm. And so it just fit right in with my pattern of life. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me how you came to join the service, how you made that decision. Well, so many people were going to war. And in Cleveland, Ohio, Everything was about the war. People were getting jobs and they were pouring into the cities, coming to work in the plants, and they were making ammunition and they were building this and they were building that. Every, all the conversation was about the war. And um, then the women went in. And that was interesting, the women are going in. And my girlfriend and I decided that would be an interesting place to be. So instead of coming back to Tennessee State College, I joined up. <laughs> well, tell me, what was the reaction of your family to that decision? It was devastating to my family members in a way. Only my father, who saw strength enough in me that I could handle what he and others knew the military experience was going to be like. My mother fainted when she was told <laughs> by my brother that I was going to join up and he was going to immediately put me on a plane and send me back to Nashville because he couldn't take responsibility for his sister going overseas or going in the military, not overseas. We had no idea we were going overseas. And he, um, uh, my mother, when they brought her to and my father came off, what happened? What, you know, what are you all talking about? And I told him, I said, my papa, I can do this. And he said, yes, you can. And he said, um, if you want to go, if you're determined to go, I won't stand in your way. But this is the advice that he gave me, which I have kept to this day. He says, remember this. You are your own decision maker. What you decide to do, you must take responsibility for it. If you do it well, take responsibility. If you do it badly, take responsibility. Don't blame it on anyone else and don't give credit to anyone else for what you do, and you will be all right. Pretty good words to live by. 
I've lived by those words because once the war was over, a whole new challenge came in my experiences and in my life because now we have the racial question looming large in our country. Mm -hmm. And there was many times and many experiences that we all had that had to make decisions that didn't seem like they were going to fit in the scheme of things. But you had to know that you couldn't blame them on anyone else. And I think to this good day, the war has been over 60 years, that advice from my father has been my support. It's wonderful advice. I'm going to be sure to tell my sons when I get home. <laughs> uh, Rose, we have to talk about the racial issue at that point in time also, but it's also a women's issue. Women had not served in the military except I think maybe in nurses role as much as World War II. That is correct. So you had you had the issue of women beginning to serve for the first time, but then you also have the the issue of uh, African American women serving. So how does all that fit together? Well that was true with men too. And so while they were working out the men's role because the men were separate. The white men and the black men were separate, but they were in the same war, in mm -hmm. the same army. Mm -hmm. And when they began to work those problems through, and as the war ended, President Truman, I think, was certainly ended the war. Roosevelt died, and I think President Truman was the one who designated the fact that we will not have segregation in the army. Mm -hmm. And once that started, that became true with the women as well. And uh, by the time that it became law, our experiences of working together for the cause of our country had already mellowed in many ways. Mm -hmm. And um, we were prepared, veterans, I want to make this clear, veterans had had the exposure of other veterans in a way in which no other time in history had. And therefore, that experience gave us a different insight into what this country could be like. So once we came out of the military, we had to change the government into looking at segregation of its own people in a way in which the rest of America would eventually look at the way they were treated. It's been a long ordeal. It's been a process that goes with history. In other countries, history has changed nations and the history in this country has changed this country into the nation in which it was originally intended mm -hmm. and this is why in the constitution it said all men are created equal so that all men would have the right to make the country a nation and that included all men. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, we began to open up doors, have dialogue, discuss with the government how we all were one on the beaches. And outside of our country, when our country needed us and that we should uh, return and be one. So we had another war. Yeah. It sounds like though that the military perhaps recognized what it took the rest of society longer to uh, recognize and deal with. It's, it's 1964 before we have the civil rights legislation, but the military dealt with it immediately after the war. Indeed, indeed. You remember the war is over in 1945. 
Mm -hmm. We had the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. Mm -hmm. You're talking about 20 years of preparation for the movement. Mm -hmm. uh, the work was done at the desk and behind the scenes because the interpretation of the law had to be brought out of. As a Methodist Center clerk, I read about the law that governs military people and how all military people went under the same rule until I was no longer in the uniform. And then I had another rule which they had made a law in certain parts of the country that wasn't in other parts of the country which was very confusing to people who were veterans because you've been trained to follow the law. And uh, if the law said that all veterans would eat lunch in the cafeteria, then all veterans should eat lunch in the cafeteria. Or the law had to be changed when you went to a cafeteria that said all white veterans eat lunch. So we had to deal with that so that we could become the nation that we had died for. And we did. And change of the law and getting our nation to look at the law was the job of the veterans. Not only was that the job of black veterans, it was the job of white veterans. And certainly without them we could not have done it. It was they who stood with us to change the law, to get the law on the table mm -hmm. before the civil rights movement came into being. That's when it spread to the communities. Mm -hmm. Up until then, it had already been discussed at the round tables. It's a war of its own, wasn't it? It was a war. Uh, Rose, when did you enter the service? Uh, I enlisted in 1943. Okay. And I, I went in in 43. I enlisted in 43, and I had to wait for some months before they had a place for uh, us to be trained. And so then I uh, went in in 40, January in 43, and I got out in 44, and the war over in 45. Now I went in in 44. I'm attached in 43, but I didn't go in to be trained in 44. And then I served in 44 and 45, and the war was over. I got out December 45. Okay. The war was over June 6, 1945. Now tell me about the branch of service that you chose. I, Did, was that your choice? It was my choice to choose the Air Force because to me the Air Force uh, was a way of getting around faster. <laughs> and uh, the, I was fascinated with flying here, there, and yon, as opposed to marching, which is what they did in the Army. And so I chose to go in the Air Force. And the Air Force also was very restricted in its selection of men because of the nature of the force itself. So I had heard that the Air Force chose men who were smarter and Therefore, I wanted to be in the best branch that we had, mm -hmm. and I thought the Air Force was it. Okay. And my brothers were in the Army. One was in the Air Force, but they were in the Army. What were the requirements for women then? What requirements did you have to meet to be eligible to join the Air Force? I think you had to be aged 21 and finished high school. And of course, in good health. Mm -hmm. But that was the only requirement that I know of. Mm -hmm. What was your training like? It was very interesting because uh, we were trained and our basic training to do things we'd never done before, carry heavy weights, climb up high mountains, swing from ropes, and all of this was to get fear out of us in the event that we would be in war and had to do it. We had to learn how to do it. And so that's what we were trying to do, to be protective of ourselves in whatever circumstances we found ourselves. So we spent days marching in the heat, marching in the cold weather, 
learning to stay outside all day. Where did you do your training? Des Moines Highway. Fort Hayes, Des Moines Highway mm -hmm. is where I trained. There was another base for women in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, but they were Army. And the Air Force trained at Des Moines Highway. Okay. And uh, that was an interesting place because I'd not been to Iowa. And that was my first experience in the West. And as a historian, I was interested in what Idaho looked like and what Utah looked like. And every opportunity I had to ride into another state, I chose it. And that interest has never won. I, today, travel wherever there's something that I need to see. And I have gone from this country, from uh, Los Angeles, California, San Francisco, Nevada, Iowa, Idaho, to Maine, all up and down the East Coast, Louisiana, Texas, all the southern states. That's my hobby. <laughs> I learned to travel. But you come home to Tennessee. <laughs> After 20 years, I returned home to Tennessee because my father was ill. And uh, I had gotten married and lived in Ohio, and I just decided that I wanted to come home. Mm -hmm. I went in, the, the woman that was over the women in the military was General Hobby, Colonel, oh, Colonel, she wasn't a general, and she had chosen this hat. This was called a hobby hat. A what hat? A hobby hat. Oh. After H O B B Y. Oh, okay. And this hat was issued to us in World War II when we first went in. This is our uniform. But we could not keep this hat because they were going to change it into another hat. So we could only take our pictures in it and then we turn it in and then we went into a new hat. And so we didn't get to wear it. We just wore it while we was in basic training. And that's called the Hobby Hat. Okay. I'm going to include a picture of that with the interview. It's, it's called the Hobby Hat. Well, was the uniform pants or was it a skirt? It was a skirt and we had pants. Um, we uh, were trained how to wear our clothes and what we can and cannot do in the clothes. When you are in the uniform, you must wear the uniform with the respect of the military. You cannot wear the buttons of the uniform in any way in which you like. They must be military. They have to be straight up. The wings on the button have to be crossed. So there is a military dress code for which you was inspected each day before you went to do your job. And you learned to live with the proper dress code. We had pants. We learned to wear our pants. Different, different jobs call for different attire. I was an office worker, so I looked like this every day. I had to wear the formal dress every day. There were women who worked on the airplanes. There were women who worked in the hospitals, and they wore uniforms, that work in uniforms. Those that worked on the planes wore plane type uniform. And they had equipment. And they had it around their waist like the men. But for those of us who worked in the offices, we were formally dressed every day that we went to work. And it became you know, you, you didn't think about it twice. When I went in the military, I had long hair, very long hair, way down my back. You'll see this long hair right here. It's rolled up because the military rule is no hair on the collar. So if your hair was longer than the collar, you had to cut the hair off. And then you were properly dressed. And this big roll was like this, a big fat roll, mm -hmm. and rolled up off the collar. And this is the first picture. So they took the scissors and cut this big roll, and it just rolled down on the floor. And some of the girls cried because they said, they cut off your beautiful hair. And 
That's the role right there. That's the last I had of that hair. Oh my goodness. And they let me take that picture and then from that after that they cut it off. So every woman's hair in the military has to be off the collar. That's the rule. Now, styles come out. I had a lot of hair. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I pushed it up. Yes, I see. It's not on the collar. Mm-hmm. And that's without the jacket. Mm-hmm. So when the weather was warm, as long as you had to tie, you could work in your office without your jacket. It was the tie that made it formal wear. Mm -hmm. My goodness. I, I think we missed something. I need to back up and let you explain to me the need for women to join. The what? The need for women to join the service in World War II because this was a new program. We talked about this before we turned the tape on. Uh, women had not served in the military. The WAX was a new program. Uh, as 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 the war moved on so hastily, and the men were leaving so rapidly, and the women were replacing them as civilians, it became even more necessary for women to do things that they were doing in offices, in hospitals, in places like that that women could do and release the men for the front line. We could not go to the front line. That was the man's job. But we could man everything else. We could run the offices and release a man to the front. So the women were not welcomed in the military because each man knew that you were there to send another man to the front line. Mm -hmm. While they didn't speak it, they felt it. While they didn't make you unwelcome, they didn't make you welcome. So you worked in an atmosphere of men who knew that you may be the cause of me going to the front line because you will learn to do my job here. And when they call for so many men from this base, I may have to go because women are doing it. So it was a very touch and go time for women, the first ones to go. And we had an obligation to prove to the world that yes, we could do this without causing undue friction in society and certainly in the military. Because once we return to society in uniform, we were recognized as the men in society, which put us in another different situation. Because then, men who had not gone into the military for whatever reasons, they couldn't go. They were civilians mm -hmm. in the world, resented these women who have had this experience and ran this uniform. Women who had never left home, so to speak, and gone into the military, resented these women in this uniform because the uniform carried with it a great deal of respect. And wherever you went and wore your uniform, you were greeted with at least respect. And that's all that we as women wanted was respect. Not adulation, not glorifying us, just respect. And the uniform commanded it. Not demanded, commanded. Wherever you went, doors were open, carpets were laid out. People respect you because you had been trained to do respectful things to wear that uniform in a respected manner. Mm. And that brought with it, from the military, a kind of lifting up of women unlike they'd ever been before. And that's 
the clue to women in the military having changed the psyche of America because of that. America in general looked at women unlike they ever looked at them before. Women looked at themselves differently also, didn't they? Indeed. You had to mm -hmm. because you didn't have time to be sensitive to the things that women usually were sensitive to. Uh, when people hurt your feeling, you, you didn't have time to cry. You were in the military. Soldiers don't cry. So women didn't cry. So it gave us a strength of character that was beyond the imagination even of mankind. Because women around the world who served in other nations as well brought a strength of character to the world and to society. And that in itself helped to change society until we began to look at ourselves as equal in society. Humans in society. And of course it caused a great deal of speculation uh, the word is adulation, um, curiosity, fear, and through it all, those experiences and that change made America the great nation it is today, as well as the lives of the men who died for it, made them stronger because there were stronger women standing by them. And they didn't have to feel that only men were strong to protect delicate women as we had all felt before the war. Mm -hmm. Now, even the men recognize that the women could stand side by side and be strong. And that changed the way men felt about women. And because of that, because of that, America changed its way of life for the men and the women and the world mm -hmm. for the better. Without a doubt. Uh, we talked earlier about the outcome of the war, the impact of, of the American women joining the uh, military and how that impacted the outcome of the war. Yes. Yes, it did. It was a resource that never was a resource that they had never had before. And they realized what it meant to have it. Because of the fact that they could then have more men to do the things when more men were needed because of the women. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it uh, had a, a real impact. Other women that you served with, did did they realize what groundbreaking they were doing? Yes. Yes, they did. It was not likely that you could be in the military, volunteer, on your own. No one made you. And not know what you were doing, why you were doing it. It wasn't the glamour to wear the uniform. It was the love of your country that made you want to wear the uniform and want to do the job that was necessary. And that's the difference between World War II 
in the rest of the time previous because we hadn't had that experience. It was a national effort, wasn't it? It was indeed a national effort. People um, on the home front, there was rationing. What do you remember? I remember that um, I think it was a problem and that um, you have to, certain things you can only get because they had to feed the military and so the rest of society had to ration what they ate and uh, they had something called ration cards I think. Uh, I think gasoline was rationed and uh, so society played a role whether they wore the uniform or not in the winning of the war. And when we look at winning the war, we must all pat ourselves on the back. All of us, every single one of America played a role in winning the war. You know, when I read uh, through history and, and look at the various conflicts that followed the Vietnam conflict and the Korean conflict, you don't see the uniting of the country the way you do with World War II. It seems like it, it just really brought the country together. Well, World War II was, a, was an experiment. Beyond that, we did things the way we thought it could be mm -hmm. or should. Uh, World War II, we did things because we had to um, and we didn't know any different. We, we tried things because here we are, we we out in the desert and there's men and women out here mm -hmm. and we've never been in the desert before and the commander is gone. Someone else has to take over. So those experiences had not been established until World War II. Now once we had those experiences we could go into the other wars with the experience of the experiences mm -hmm. that we've had. And therefore, we can say this didn't work well. This was not good. This was good. We'll keep this. Mm -hmm. So we were the beginning of getting the basis of how to make it work. And that's why in World War II, there was this cohesiveness that there was no other way. We didn't have time not to have it because we, we were engaged in a great battle. And so we had to work together. And if we had to carry buckets of water, we had to pass one to the other. We, we didn't have time for anything else. We had to get the water to the, where we had to get it. And those kinds of experiences taught us things. And those of us who tried to change things after the war reminded ourselves and others that this will work. It will be okay. It will not take away from you. You will still be important. You are trying to add As I was saying, it, it gave us the sense that we could stand on this premise that it will not hurt you. Hmm. It will not destroy you. Now you're right. If two soldiers are shooting and standing side by side and they both get killed, they are two soldiers. It's only after you look at them that you discover one is black and one is white. We learned that and we had a job to do in our country to tell them it will not take away, it will enhance you because we proved it when we needed two people to man the canoe, mm -hmm. uh, to man what we had. The strength of two people made the job we won with it. Mm -hmm. The strength of two people back home will win. 
if we don't introduce something to take away from the strengths of both. All humans bring the same strength. We all are different and we all are the same. But the difference comes in exposure to life's situations. If we all are exposed to the same thing, we can all learn to do it mm -hmm. the same way. Mm -hmm. We proved that in the military. Mm -hmm. And that works. It worked in the military. We won the war. It can work here. And we came out of it with that philosophy. We can win this war. And let's take the same love of human nature to win the war of discrimination that is bringing our country down. And until this day, we haven't stopped. Because there's still wars and rumors of wars. Until this day, there's still wars. There's been many wars since then. So they don't end. You just learn to utilize the previous skills and lessen some of the damage that's done because you have learned some things. It's the value of history. Tell me about your assignment after your training was over. My yes. assignment? Yes, your assignment with the military. After your training was over, you went into, uh, what was your unit? Uh, I was with the, uh, I was, uh, my unit on the base that I was sent from Des Moines, Iowa to Douglas Air Force Base in uh, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And it was a bombardier base, B-25. And uh, I was uh, placed in headquarters. Two women out of a unit of 40 on a base um, went to headquarters. The other women went to different parts of the base to do different things. Uh, some had been trained doing basic training in hospitals to do hospital work. Some were trained, went to uh, technical schools to learn how to work on the airplanes. I was already trained in college as a secretary, mm -hmm. and I could be a secretary without any other training. And so I was not trained. I was sent directly into the headquarters. Mm -hmm. And in headquarters, I was placed in Mrs. Center. The Mrs. Center is the intelligence unit of a base, and every base has one. It's the unit in the headquarters that receives the military coded messages. And these messages are coded, filed, distributed, and handled by the commander of the base. And you work directly with the commander and for the commander. In the office in which I worked, there was approximately um, 80 people. They did different things. 25 maybe were typing. These were civilian women. Oh, okay. They worked for the military. Okay. There were soldiers in the Air Force, such as myself, who also typed, who translated the codes. They'd been trained to do that. And I started off being the file clerk, which is when you go in an office, the first thing they let you do is file, mm -hmm. so that you know what you're filing. So in being the file clerk, not only did I know how to put A before B, I also read what A was about. So that was the law of the military. And I got in the habit of reading the law. And as a file clerk, I moved from that to a typist. I typed messages. Mm -hmm. I moved from that to sergeant in charge of typists. There was no other military women in my unit. All the women who worked for me were civilian and all were white. How did that work? Beautifully because they worked for the military. Mm -hmm. Because if you didn't want to work 
on the military base, under the military rule, you could get a job in town under some other group. Mm -hmm. But if you worked on the military base, the military, you worked for the military and you went by the rules. There was no problem. There was some sensitivity among the women at times, but they understood that they wanted a good paying job, that they had left their jobs to come on that base to work. Mm -hmm. And so they um, did their jobs. And uh, the men uh, respected my rank and worked well with me too. And I must say this, that there were men there in the military that did a great deal to help me. There were sergeants that I worked for who taught me tricks of the trade. They, many of them went on overseas, went on to the front line, and uh, I was promoted up the line from job to job, from the file clerk to the chief. I ran the message center, and when the war was deep, and when I had been attached to this group of women, it was there as the chief of the message center. Everybody there worked for me. I was sergeant in charge. We did a great job. My commander was very proud. He uh, insisted that I stay there and run that base. And that's when my unit went on overseas and he said, I will fly you there and you will catch up with them. But this base is in disarray and you stay here. And he upgraded me from the chief to the sergeant major of the post. And my job then was to screen everybody who needed to talk to the colonel. So if you came to this base and needed to see the colonel, you came by my desk first. And that's what I did and that's what I was doing when I left the military. But my training is shown on my discharge because those were the deeper experiences that uh, how you train people, how you teach them to do the job. Mm -hmm. And I was given the Postal Service Women's title of this unit that one overseas. Mm -hmm. But I never worked in the post office. But I could. Mm -hmm. But when I got out of the military, then I couldn't work in the post office. Mm -hmm. And you know why. <laughs> Did that bother you? Does it bother me now? No, not now, but then. I mean... Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. It bothered me tremendously. Tremendously. I had given everything that I had to give. This was my country. I sworn to uphold the laws of this country, I'll give my life for it. If I had stepped on a bomb or stepped on a rock and died, I would have been buried with honors in a national cemetery like any other soldier. Did it bother me? Yes. Did I ask for anything I wasn't deserving of? No. Was I able to do the job? Yes. Then why could I not get a job working in the U.S. Post Office in the United States? The question is, we hadn't come that far yet. Mm -hmm. And that's why the war of returning from the war begin a new phase in my life, seeing that the government held to its laws, which they had taught me, which I could explain to generals, to colonels, to lieutenants, to civilians. All we ask is citizenship of the country for which we gave our all. No more, no less. Just what we are entitled. And so we had to go to court. We had to do many things. 
We had to take jobs that we didn't want. We had to live in our own country without reaching our potential as citizens because of the rules that were left hanging of who it was could have a job. And it was those times that I was most distressed. I was never afraid of encountering the enemy. I remember eating in a mess hall and we had some German prisoners serving us. And I kept trying to talk to them and uh, they kept telling me, you can't talk to them, you're not allowed to talk to them. But I wasn't afraid of them and yet Germans were killing our men every day. And so I wasn't afraid to stand up in my country and say, this is my country. The same reason that it is your country, it is mine. I was born here and I fought for it. I don't want anything that is not do me. And I will fight for that. You know, we're so far removed from that point in time that it's hard for many of us, uh, even even for me, because sure. I was born after the war, sure. to be able to back up and see with those eyes. Well, sure. And it's, 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 that's part of the reason why it's important that we, I showed you this flag said what we don't record, we lose. Mm -hmm. If you never hear this story, and this story meaning story of women that was in the military, mm -hmm. you lose something. Mm -hmm. You lose the fact that women of courage stood their grounds many years before you were born. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you can teach your daughter when you're gone from here, that she can have courage. The significance is that we pass on that which is good to the next generation. Not just for ourselves. It has no meaning for me just to get the job with the government that I can do. It's for the next generation. And since the time that I've been in the military and been out, I have spent a lifetime, much more since I've been out, because I've been out longer, saying to my government, we must not fail future. Well, when I heard you speak at MTSU, you were asked how did the war change the role of women? And I was so impressed with what you said, and you've just been telling me off the tape, so I'm going to let you tell me again that it changed the psychic yes, of the country. It changed the psychic of the country because for the first time in the history of this country, women who had walked a certain number of steps behind the man had been a way of life for the world. And therefore, to say, we want to stand where we are, wherever that is, was new. It was new in our psyche. Because men were trained to be men. And women were trained to do what men said. And the war brought out for women the ability to dictate how they would accept change. Once a woman learned that she can command a group of women on a military base, it was no question that once she became a civilian, she could run a university. She could run an office. 
she could manage a church. She could run the household. And those experiences changed society. But the question, Rose, becomes she knew that she could run the university. But the country wasn't ready for that yet, so there's a gap of time there, at least 20 years. What happens to her? What, what does she do sitting and knowing that she has that ability, but she, not being able to... Uh, she no longer accepted from the male that she couldn't do it. That's what happened to her. He would tell her, you're my wife, you're my girlfriend, you're my sister, you're my mother. I will go out and do this, this, this. You do this, this, and this. And she remembered, when you were not here, I had to go out and do this, this, and this. And I did it. Mm -hmm. I held until you returned. Now that you have returned, I want to be recognized as an individual person who can do this, this, and this. And it created a whole new situation for us as a people because women never wanted to return to where they were and to this good day. When we look at the last 20 years, from the time that we couldn't drive the school bus, to the fact that we can head the educational system, that it did change it. Mm -hmm. And it was because of that experience. Mm -hmm. And because of the experiences we've had in the last 20 years, there are going to be many more changes. Not just in doing things, but in how we feel about ourselves. Because when we look at ourselves, we are becoming a sad people. When we look at our political arena and see the kinds of things that we are concentrating on now, as opposed to in the past, we are beginning to feel that somehow we are losing this newfound power that we found in ourselves. Women can stand behind the podiums and speak for Americans as well as for women and they will never leave that and this has caused a kind of sadness in our men that they have never felt before and it's going to be a new society as we move on into the next century. It's going to become acceptable and it'll be different, hopefully for the better, because then we utilize all the skills that God gave all of us. And this will be a great America and we don't have to feel sad about anything. Rose, it's obvious that the war had a tremendous impact on your life. Uh, because you express it so well. Uh. It did. I had the good life. I didn't know I was poor. It was rich in people. It was rich in learning. Things I'd never been exposed to. Kind of love that was shown to me from the women that I lived with, that I slept in the barracks with that I ate with, that I fought with, that I fought for. It made me know what a great 
great person, Rose is. Mm -hmm. It made me stronger and made me willing to bring out the same kind of greatness in every woman that I meet. And my life has been working on behalf of women. And I have been fortunate to have been exposed to the greatest minds in America who are doing the same thing, trying to refocus our country on utilizing everything that it has. And that is what has happened in my life. And I feel like how fortunate, what a great life I've had, what experiences I've had. I would wish them for every young woman there is hmm. to have met, to have been accepted, even where I was not accepted. Mm -hmm. To be loved by people who didn't even know how to love. There were people I have met in my time that didn't love anybody. They didn't love themselves and they didn't know about love. And some of them have told me, when I met you, Rose, you were bigger than all the problems in the world. You just loved us and we loved you and now you're my sister, the sister I never had. They were not of color. They were not of color. They were of kind. They were women. Mm. And I don't know that I have encountered any woman that I didn't feel an attachment to. There's my sister. That's tremendous. I've kept you a long time, but I'd like to keep you a little bit longer because I want you to tell me, I didn't know about this until we got here and got to talking. I want you to tell me about the Women's Memorial in Washington and your involvement in that. The Women's Memorial, when I met General Vault, and um, she was dynamic in explaining what her hopes were, that there would be some honor for those women who had served. And of course, having been one of the women who served, I was delighted to know about it and could be a part of it. And she told me what role she wanted women to play across this country that it was going to take women coming together to get the memorial built to honor women. Well, now you told me earlier, and it ties with this memorial thing, that a lot of women's records were lost. That is true. The women records, like some men's records, were lost and uh, never to be found. There was a disaster at some point at the warehouse. I believe it was in out west. And some records got burned or something. But then there were women's records that was just dis disappeared off the face of the earth. And those women needed to be a part of this memorial. And many of those women were just walking around and didn't know about the memorial. And so it was the general's idea and her staff to have volunteer women representatives to find the women in your area to be certain that every woman's name would appear at this memorial. Mm -hmm. And as the representative from this town, Maury County, in Columbia, I came from Washington and announced to Columbia that I was looking for women who served in the military to be certain that their name appeared on the memorial. Now, many of our us was, records weren't lost, but there were some whose records were lost. Mm -hmm. And that was the job of the field representative, which you just read my letter, mm -hmm. to find these women and send their names back to Washington to be certain that they got on that memorial and make speeches around for people to help them do that. And uh, 
that became a joy for me because it introduced me to other women in the military. And, uh, and they would tell me their stories and we would exchange stories and we were like sisters. And that's been my life's work since I retired from the federal government where I worked as an administrator in uh, Social Security Administration and uh, Internal Revenue Service. And uh, I can't say enough to young women to whom I speak at colleges now about giving yourself. I go back to my father. Make a decision about what you want to do and give yourself an opportunity to do some things in life and then take responsibility for it. So if you want some experience, join the military. And you should be a recruiter. Everyone has said all the time, why have you not ever recruited? I said, because I worked for the government and they told me to shut your mouth, Rose. Uh, uh, you, you're not out here now, you're <laughs> working for the industry. But anyway, I, I really am a recruiter. It's just that I'm not employed to do it. <laughs> In churches or wherever I speak to young women, um, I say to them, look at the military as an experience you might be interested in. And as a military person, I can tell you, I can vouch for it, that you will never have an experience that will fit you any better for the world than the military. Because not only you can go to college and get you a degree, and that's important to do that, you can go to the military and get your degree because that's about people and it's important to do that That's true. because once you graduate from college you've got to walk out into the real world <laughs> and take on people that's so very true well um, do you mind telling me on tape uh, the story with your son and Senator Kennedy and the assistance that you were able to provide the general on the getting the legislation for the memorial? Uh, uh, no, I don't mind telling you. I, uh, um, at, at, at the time that I met the general and uh, the memorial was being contemplated and needed to be brought before the commission, uh, the Senate committee, mm -hmm. committee, Senator Kennedy was head of the committee. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I told the general that uh, I would ask my son, who was an aide to Senator Kennedy, to encourage the senator that there were women out here waiting for him to bring it before the committee. And uh, he did. What happened, I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But General Vault has always been close to my son. And when I see her now, she says, how's Gregory? Mm -hmm. um, because she remembered that I said, we will do what we can do and see what he can do. And we know this, that it did come up for committee and the foundation was established and we went on to build a memorial. That was some 10 years before maybe the memorial was built. Mm -hmm. And I had worked very closely with the women uh, who uh, work in the field representatives on that. But um, he went on to work for the senator for several years and then the senator ran for president. And then he got out and went to work for the Food and Drug Administration. He was a drug lawyer. And um, he, left, he left Washington and went to be a a lawyer at Harvard where he had gotten his law degree and he left there and became the general counsel at Brandeis University and he left there and he is now vice president and general counsel for the new school university in New York City 
my oldest son. My youngest son is in the Air Force Reserves for more than 20 years. He is in the MASH unit and he is a master sergeant. He was at Kelly, but they recently closed Kelly. And he's at the base where I took basic training, San Antonio in Texas. And he has been around since Panama, flying the supplies for the medical unit to fight the wars. He went to Alaska, he went to Panama, he went to Desert Storm, he went lately, some years back, to the Pentagon to sit at a conference with the generals about the medical profession in the Air Force. And he has more than 20 years in the Air Force, and that's my youngest. And he will stay as long as they'll keep him, I guess. <laughs> oh. Rose, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this interview. Um, I told you I've been pursuing this interview for over a year because when I heard you speak at MTSU, I was so impressed with your memories. I, I, I hope that I have a overdone it. No. Uh, I'm known to go on and on because I believe that uh, I have been honored and I want the world to know that I know I have been honored to have had an opportunity to serve my country. And so I do go on and on about it because I am proud to be an American. You must be um, you must be pleased with the what seems to be a resurgence of interest in World War II that we're seeing across this country, uh, the movie Pearl Harbor and um, Saving Private Ryan. It's, it seems like we're ready to know more about that that period in time now. I think the reason there's a resurgence is that World War II veterans are coming up 80 years old and they are dying a thousand a day. And while these stories are still within them, mm -hmm. it's why the resurgence of making certain that we record mm -hmm. what happened. Because as you and I know, what we don't record, we lose. And history, as you remember my saying, is about time and place. And uh, when we look back on 1776, we can't imagine the people of that time. But we know about the bell in Philadelphia. And I had an opportunity to ring that bell in Philadelphia. And uh, I rode from Philadelphia to Gettysburg. And I used to brag about how beautiful Tennessee was. And I found out, I married a man from Philadelphia who told me, you haven't seen beauty till you see Pennsylvania. And while he's now sleeping in the military grade, I remember he was right. That is one of the most beautiful parts of this country, is that drive from Philadelphia to Gettysburg and to get to Gettysburg and see this history of those who died in 1776 and later makes me know that this history in this century one day will be as important mm -hmm. as that was to me. And that's why I tell it. Will you tell it well? 
I'm so impressed. Um, the more I interview veterans, the more awestruck that I am at what they accomplished and what it's meant in my life I, that I take for granted, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, you have some sons too, don't you? Yes, I do. They'll be called up if we have a war. Oh. Uh, what's this? Women in Military Service for American Memorial. You must be very proud of this. I would think the memorial would be very rewarding to you. It is, and I hope that not only is it rewarding to me, having served, that it is more rewarding to those who have not served. And I hope that you go there and see that memorial. The Women's Memorial is at the gateway to Arlington Cemetery. We in the building. You have to go through the building to get to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. In that building is the Women's Memorial, the story of the women that has served from the World War I up until now is there. And you look in that memorial at the women in the state in which you live and see their names appear. And hopefully that you will see the name Rose Witherspoon Spence, because it's there. I saw it. Mm. And know that you have a friend and you have honored me unlike you don't know, to think enough of that, to ask me to do this. Oh, I'm sitting here the one who thinks <laughs> that I'm being honored that you took time to do this because this is a, a beautiful story, so well spoken. I told you uh, in interviewing some of the veterans, there are veterans whose uh, battle experience is something that they don't want to that's describe. Right, that's right, and they can't. They can't bring it back. Mm -hmm. it, they buried it, mm -hmm. and it's too painful. Mm -hmm. They can't talk about it. But I do always uh, ask them the impact that it had on their life and on the generation. And some of them uh, really aren't outspoken in the impact about the impact. Um, and I think the impact is probably greater than, than they're stating to me because you couldn't have done this and remain the same person that you were when you started. It, it had to expand your world. Oh, it did. Um, it did indeed. It expanded my world unlike nothing in this world. This lady here. Charity Adams Early? Yes. She carried those women over there. And this is the story of those women that went overseas, that one group of women, black women, this is the only group during World War II that went overseas, the 68th, 88th postal unit. How did that And they went to about? Paris, France. How did, how did they, how were they chosen to go overseas? Um, during the war, there was this argument about not exposing black folk to war. Um, and there was a lot of news it's all there, it's all recorded, it's mm -hmm. in all the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And they finally sent, they were trained, but they hadn't been on the front lines and they were in the backgrounds, and they finally sent them over. And then then, then the women went over. And then uh, there was this debate about groups of women went over. Excuse me. And they finally concluded, the hierarchy, the generals or whoever makes that decision, that they would send a unit of black women over. And that's her unit. She was my commander at basic training in Des Moines, Iowa. That's where she was, and that's mm -hmm. where I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this was some time later when they chose the unit. And they chose the unit from women around the country. However, they chose them. I don't know how they did that, but I had been chosen as one of them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, I always, I never in many ways regretted not being there. I would have loved to. They went to Rouen, France, and they stayed there, and they worked in a factory, in a, in a warehouse, not a factory, mm -hmm. and they sorted the mail. And that was what they did. And mm -hmm. they tell all the things that they did. They encountered prejudice 
as well as everyone else did in this country when they returned. And, uh, but my experiences here in the States, I always said this is my unit because I was attached to them. Mm -hmm. They went without me and my, and my commander didn't get me over there to catch up with them. <laughs> but he exposed me to so many other things mm -hmm. and the work that I was doing on the base. The pilots who uh, would come back from overseas uh, and had flown missions came to the base. Mm -hmm. uh, there was this excitement of, of the planes and the different kinds of planes coming and the excitement of seeing women fly those planes uh, in the first women to fly. And they, they would fly occasionally on my base and I would see them, mm -hmm. which was great that, just to see those women fly planes. They didn't fly the bomber planes, but they fly the transport, mm -hmm. flying equipment and things there. And you could, it's like living life. Here they, it's all right here for you. So I never really regretted a lot that I didn't go with them. I kept up with them as to what they were doing. But, uh, and I felt like, oh, so I'm bad to in the mail, okay, but here I am sitting here doing this and got people doing that and doing other. And so I felt that uh, my responsibilities were heavy. Uh, and that perhaps even heavier than they might have been as a clerk in a warehouse distributing mail. Sounds like it. So I looked at it from that point of view. Mm -hmm. And certainly I made the most of it. I made the most of it. I enjoyed everybody that came through. I met great people, great pilots. Um, Joe Lewis flew on the base and other dignitaries. I had an opportunity to meet and talk with them. The great men who flew the fighters and the 99th Pursuit Squadron, they flew on the base. I got to meet them and uh, eat dinner with them in the, on the base and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I had a real, real experience, even though I didn't actually sort the mail mm -hmm. uh, with them over there. So I have never really regretted it a lot. But I lay claim to it whenever <laughs> I speak, because they were my unit. <laughs> Well, I have kept you so long. You haven't kept you me long. So I've kept you long. long. But I hope you didn't have plan to do anything else today. No. That's what I'm doing today. I'm going to make pictures oh, okay. of some of these. Okay. And I'm going to make copies of this. Is there anything in your war experience that, that I haven't asked you to share that you would like to record for the young men and young women that will be using this to study? Um... The experience of playing basketball was great. Well, you, you know, I want to ask you about that. How did I, that come about? Well, because I was an athlete mm -hmm. in, in college, and I played basketball. Now, there's my team right there. And we, we flew everywhere over nine service command, and we played softball, and uh, against other whacks on other bases. That's what we did. So this was an entertainment? Yeah. It was uh, well, well. It was part of the uh, uh, physical training exercises. We not only did the exercises; we played sports, like the men did. Mm -hmm. And we traveled to base to base and played with other women on other bases. And um, that was an experience because um, we had, we flew all over. We arrived on different bases and. Went over in old country, went into, uh, uh, played against teams in uh, Mexico, because we was right on the border. Uh -huh. And we played against army teams. There were army teams. I was in the Air Force, but there was Fort Huachuca, and there were, I played at Camp Hood and Fort Huachuca and other places around in mm -hmm. Arizona and Texas. Oh, so it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. to, that was what I did when I got off of work. <laughs> it wasn't all work then. <laughs> you did have some time of enjoyment and entertainment. We did indeed. We, we danced and we went to the clubs and we did all the things that everybody do. And uh, Just about every veteran that I've interviewed has talked about dancing. Apparently dancing was much, was enjoyed much more in World War II than in the other nightclub, it was clubs on the base, mm -hmm. and then the, that's the only place where you saw women. After you got through doing your work, out at five o'clock was at the, at the uh, MCO clubs. 
Were there restrictions on you in uh, men and women being together? Was was it encouraged to spend time together, or were there strict restrictions? Well, it wasn't a choice. If you on the base and it's only forty women on the base and it's five thousand men, mm -hmm. I mean, you 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 worked with men all day every day. Mm -hmm. See. As I told you, only one girl was in headquarters, so I worked with all the men that worked in headquarters. There may have been three or four hundred men there. But I mean, perhaps dating? Did they oh, we did, them? yes. Oh, you did? Oh, yes, we did. And uh, we did the same thing we do at home. Well, oh. we had a chance to... That's Joe Lewis. That's when I met him. I met him out on the line, and this is the officer who greeted him. That's Joe Lewis. And I drove him back to headquarters. And in my job as Sergeant Major, when you flew into my base, when generals are important people, then my then he would send me down in the jeep to pick you up and bring you back to headquarters. This I'm is the morning hour. I'm gonna see if I can make pictures of some of these. I tried it before and it's worked out. <laughs> we'll see how they do. This is what a love letter used to look like. A love letter. When you were writing to a guy that was overseas and in the military. Oh, this is V-mail? Yeah. Is this what it is? That's People have talked to me about that's it. What, it's that's so tiny. Mean. That is, that's what it is. That's it. It's, it's so small. What, did you write on something else and this is just a... Yeah, that they, they recorded, so, you know, they had to make everything small. Uh, my goodness. It is small. That was one of my officers. And you see, she called herself Ma. <laughs> and this is us arriving in Iowa, and this is one of the guys, and here's my, here's my baseball team again. And I couldn't tell you the name of but one girl on there, and she is in Ohio now. She and I live to look at craziness, look at craziness. So this is what the best underwear that we were issued. Oh my goodness. And, and, and taking pictures, they just performing in the underwear. <laughs> now these pictures are pictures that's left over from the war. I just didn't know I got them in a book swimming and here we are flying around somewhere here this is, must have been a wonderful here experience is, uh, my library card little country girl yes it was that's my library card you have to have a card um uh, dating dating that's some of the girls so when we had weekends we would go up in the mountains and Places like that, and it would be the men and the women. Uh huh. Because those are the men we saw. We uh -huh. ones in the military. So, uh, riding horses, I'm a lover of horses. There's another one of my officers. These are some of the girls that play basketball. Most of all the pictures are gone now because through the years, you know, it's been 60 years. These are treasures. And, and I, I, I was looking, I said, I need to look up and find something, and ran into these, and I said, my goodness, I haven't seen these things in years. And you can see our uniforms. Now, this is a Nash V in my hair. I met her. She had been in New York or something, and she joined the service. This is one of our sergeants. She was a good friend. It's just different people. These are girls who on the on baseball team that we played against in Texas. This is this is when the bus broke down in in the desert, <laughs> and we walking around while they fixed the bus. These guys were a part of the 99th Pursuit Squadron trainees during the war when they stopped training them and they sent them to our base to do the um, some guy I liked. <laughs> And this is a young lady who was a photographer for the Post. Oh my goodness. Uh-huh. See? So that's the kind of training that we had. Mm -hmm. She was sent off to training school to be a Post photographer. But she was a woman, so. I'd like, that, I'm going to try to copy uh, that. That's a real good uh, look at the uniform. Is uh -huh. this the different hat you were talking about that changed uh -huh. to the little small? That, uh -huh. That's the hat they changed from the harder hat to mm -hmm. that hat. And my girlfriend with the mop. So you had to you had to do KP. This is the train station in Arizona. This is the barrack in Arizona. That's one. Of, that's the day room. Were the uh, barracks segregated? There wasn't any other wax there. Just black wax. Oh, so okay. 
uh, on the base when I was in the military. Oh, no. Now they're all together. Look at all those cactus. As I was on for you. I thought these were kind of fun for you. Oh, they are. They're wonderful. <laughs> Let's see if I can make some copies of them. I'm going to take them probably outside to get better light. Okay. Get a natural light on them. Okay. I think this thing's still running, so I'm going to cut it off. I do appreciate very, very much you doing. Well, I'm, I'm flattered to show you my life.